Hi and welcome back to the program analysis course. This is part three of the lecture on information flow analysis. And what we'll see in this third part of the lecture is um, how to actually analyze information flow. So given an information flow policy, which as we've seen in the previous video tells the analysis what it should check, we will now see how the analysis actually checks the flow of information through the program. So at a high level, what the information flow analysis is supposed to do is to check for violations of a given um, information flow policy. Um, this kind of check has various applications. One of the uh, potentially, uh, yeah, probably most common ones is to detect vulnerable code. So for example, you want to check whether um, some uh, code is vulnerable to, let's say, uh, an SQL injection because some input that may um, come in from a user or an untrusted user, so a potential attacker, could lead to something that is then interpreted as an SQL injection. And by tracking whether this uh, kind of propagation is possible in the code, you're essentially checking whether the code is vulnerable to um, SQL injection attacks. Another kind of application is to check if some code is malicious. So for example, you may want to check if code violate some privacy policy by, for example, sending some data that you know to be um, private um, out into the network um, and by doing this um, breaches some kind of uh, or breaks some kind of privacy policy. Or more broadly, you can just use this analysis to check if the program behaves as expected by, for example, checking whether some secret data um, um, is written to the console and if it is and if you have um, specify the policy that would detect this, then the information flow analysis will basically help you to check if the program does not do um, this kind of um, bad behavior. So now when an analysis tracks the flow of information through a program, there are two fundamentally different kinds of flows that it uh, can track. And these are called explicit flows and implicit flows. So an explicit flow is a flow of information that is caused by a data flow dependency. So we have some data that directly flows to some um, other memory location through a data flow, and this is an explicit flow. In contrast, an implicit flow is caused by a control flow dependency. So we have some secret data that influences whether the flow of control goes this way or that way, and by doing this, um, um, kind of influence, it's actually um, um, creating a flow of information and this is called an implicit flow. For example, let's again look at the credit card example that we've already seen a couple of times in this lecture now, um, where we had this secret information stored here, which is then assigned to this variable and this variable is then used in this check here to eventually, if the condition is true, assign something to the variable visible. In this example, we have both explicit flows and implicit flows. So we do have an explicit flow here at this assignment because um, there's a data flow from credit card number to variable X, which clearly propagates some information. We also have this um, implicit flow down here where this conditional, which depends on the secret um, variable or the secret value, um, uh, determines whether we are executing this statement here. And because this um, is a control flow dependency, um, this is an implicit flow. There are some analyses that only check for explicit flows and the terminology differs a bit. Sometimes they, these kind of analyses are called taint analysis. Um, sometimes they're also called information flow analysis. So I would recommend to not rely on the terminology alone, but to actually, whenever you hear about some kind of analysis like this, to check whether they um, track explicit flows or also implicit flows, um, or, or maybe just, just one of them. As practically every program analysis problem, um, also information flow analysis can be addressed in two fundamentally different ways, namely through static analysis and through dynamic analysis. Um, a static information flow analysis typically over approximates all possible um, flows that could happen. So it's over approximating all possible data flows and all possible control flows. And then as a result, what it will tell you is whether some information may flow from a secret source to an untrusted sink. In the course project, you're actually implementing one of these um, static information flow analyses, one that only looks at explicit flows because you only look at data flow analyses, uh, sorry, data flows in this analysis. Um, and as you've probably figured out by now, um, you do not just report this over approximation of may flow, 
um, but um, in the project you also um, are supposed to report whether some information must flow from a secret source to an untrusted sink. But in general, if people talk about static information flow analysis, usually they mean an analysis that over approximates and that reports may flow information. The other kind of analysis, which is actually the focus of the rest of this lecture, um, is about dynamic information flow analysis, where we are associating um, some security labels, sometimes called taint markings, with particular memory locations while the program is running. And then while the program is executing particular operations, we are propagating these labels um, through the program so that at runtime we can check whether some information propagates from a secret source to an untrusted sink. So before a dynamic analysis can check whether there is a flow of information, we need to define the taint sources and the taint sinks. So basically from where to where we want to track um, for information flows. And here's just a non-exhaustive list of possible sources that um, a program analysis could consider. So first of all, there are of course variables. That's um, basically what we've already seen in the simple examples so far. But you could also, for example, say that the return values of a particular function are considered uh, a source and everything that is returned by that function should be tracked. Or you could say that every data that is read from a particular IO stream should be considered a, taint, um, uh, a tainted value. So for example, everything you read from a particular file. Um, you also need to define um, possible things. So again, these could be variables, but it could, for example, also be parameters given to a particular function. So one um, um, very typical example is the eval function in JavaScript, where everything where you want to track whether something may be propagated to eval, because eval will then evaluate whatever you give to that function as a piece of code and will execute it. So if you want to check for code injection vulnerabilities, you would typically say that eval um, is a sync. Or you could also say that um, instructions of a particular type are sync. So for example, you may not want some tainted value to influence the flow of control in your program at all. And in this case, you would basically say that every jump instruction is a sync. Um, and now what the analysis does, given these um, taint sources and taint sinks, is to report any illegal flow of a taint marking that comes from um, uh, a, a sink to, uh, uh, sorry, from a source to a sink. Let's now have a look at how the analysis is propagating the taints through the program so that it can eventually determine whether there is a violation um, of this no flow from source to sink policy. And let's start with the first kind of flow, namely explicit flows, which is the easier of the two. Um, so the basic idea is that for every operation in the program that produces a new value, the analysis is looking at the labels at the security classes of the inputs of that operation and then propagates these labels to the output of the operation. So there may just be one input, there may be two inputs, there may be more inputs. No matter what the number is, um, the analysis will look at the labels of these inputs and then combines these labels using the least upper bound operator that we have seen when we looked at universally bounded lattices and um, takes the result of this operation as the label of the result of the um, operation that the program is usually doing. So basically on top of the normal execution that is computing the result of some operation, it's also computing the result of, the, of this label level operation to know what security label um, the, the, the result of the operation has. So this is what happens for explicit flows. Let's now have a look at what happens for implicit flows. So how does the analysis propagate um, information to track implicit flows? Um, here the idea is that the analysis maintains a so-called security stack, which is essentially a stack of all the labels of those values that have influenced the current flow of control. So if we are at a particular location in the program because of some decisions, then the labels that have determined these decisions will be put on the stack. So precisely this happens um, as follows. Whenever some value X influences a branch decision in our program at some location, um, lock, then the analysis is pushing the label um, of this value x onto our security stack. And then when the um, control flow reaches the immediate post dominator of this location um, lock, basically the place where the flow of control um, merges again and where we would go anyway, no matter what the branch decision was, then this label of x is again 
popped from S so that we do not have this label on the stack anymore. And then whenever um, any operation is executed while the stack S is non-empty, so basically whenever we are under the control of some secret value, then all the labels um, of um, um, that are on our stack S also will be considered as inputs to the operation because essentially we are only performing this operation because of something um, that had label um, the, a label that is now on S. So let's illustrate this tracking of um, security labels using uh, two examples. The first one I'll explain, and then the second one is um, a little quiz for you. So in example one, we again look at this credit card code that we have, and now we also need to define the policy that is um, supposed to be checked here. So in this example, um, we have two security classes. namely public and secret. And we are defining as our only source this variable called credit card number, or more precisely the initial value it gets at the first line. And as the sync, as before when we looked at this example, um, we care about whether this secret information can flow into our variable called visible. So let's now go step by step through every operation in this program and let's have a look at how these operations influence the security labels that the analysis is tracking. So after this first assignment, so basically just after this line, um, what we have is that the label of what is stored in credit card number is secret. So this is simply because this is the source that we have defined. Then um, the first is, or the second assignment actually, that happens here. So after the second line, um, we have observed an explicit flow because there's a data flow um, from credit card number to X. So we take the label that is um, the label of credit card number and make this the label of X, which means that after this explicit flow, the label of X will also be secret. In the third line, um, we are assigning this um, value of false to visible. So after this line, um, the label of visible will be the label of all the inputs. Now this only input here was um, this literal false, which um, by definition is public. So the label of visible will be public. Then comes the interesting part because now we're looking into this um, condition of X being larger than 1000, which means when this um, condition is check checked, the program produces some intermediate value, which is a boolean. So let's just call this intermediate um, value B. And of course this value, because it's a value, will also have a label. And the label of this value B will be the combination of the um, labels of all the inputs of this operation. So specifically that's the label of X and then combined um, with the label of 1000, which means we are taking secret and combine this with the least upper bound operator with public. Public is the label of 1000 because by definition, it's just a literal in the program. And the result of this will be secret. And now because this is a control flow decision, which de depends on B, we will push the label of B. So we will push secret onto our security stack S. Next, we are reaching this line here um, in the uh, if block where now all the labels on S are part of the input of whatever happens in this block.
And the, the underlying reason simply is that we are only here at this line because um, of this conditional, which in this case was secret. And now when we compute the label of uh, visible, basically just after this um, um, last assignment here, we do not only take the label of true into consideration, but also the labels that are on our stack, so in this case secret, and then combine this with the label of, of true, which in this case will be public. But because secret combined with public using the least upper bound operator gives secret, it means that at the end we have um, the label secret attached to visible. And this, because secret is our sync, happens to be a violation of the policy, which is the outcome that you've of course already seen um, in this uh, lecture, but now you also know in detail why this is actually um, what the information flow analysis reports. So now the second example will be an example that I just tell you, but I will not tell you the solution. And the idea is that um, you should solve it by yourself. And if you're not sure about the outcome, feel free to share your answer um, in the Ilias forum with the other students so that you can double check um, what the solution is. But I, I really want you to try this um, on your own instead of just looking at me doing it. So here um, we again have a piece of code and we again um, define our security classes, which again are just two, public and secret. Um, the source in this case is this getx um, method or specifically the return value of this method. And the sync is this foo method or specifically the parameters or the arguments that are given to, to foo. And now in this execution that you are um, analyzing here, you should suppose that getx x returns um, the value five. And then you should basically do what the analysis is doing and write down the labels of all the um, uh, uh, yeah, relevant variables after each operation. And then at the end, you should be able to figure out whether there is a policy violation or not. So now you've hopefully stopped the video and done the quiz. And then we can move on to um, another interesting aspect of tracking implicit flows, which are so-called hidden implicit flows. So, so far we've only talked about explicit flows and implicit flows, but there's actually a subcategory of implicit flows, which um, are sometimes called hidden implicit flows. And these implicit flows um, are hidden in the sense that um, they only happen um, because a branch is not executed, which makes it really difficult for a dynamic analysis to track it because a dynamic analysis by definition only tracks what happens and what is executed. So the approach that I've explained so far is actually missing these hidden flows. And just as a very simple example to illustrate why this happens, um, let's have a look at this uh, example here where we have three lines of code. So we have one variable called x, which initially is false, and the label of x should be public. So this is just a public variable. And then we have this other variable called secret, which um, is labeled as private. So whenever um, um, something secret uh, or something from secret is assigned, somewhere, then this should also be um, private. Um, or if secret determines a control flow decision, then whatever happens should also um, be labeled as private. Now, what this piece of code here um, essentially does is to copy the value of secret into X, um, because initially X is false. If secret is true, then we also make X true. So after executing these three lines, the value of a secret will be copied um, to X, even though there is no direct copying happening, but it's it just indirectly happening um, through the flow of control here. But now if we see an execution where secret happens to be false, then this statement down here isn't really executed, which means that according to the dynamic information flow analysis that I've explained so far, um, nothing, um, um, nothing is propagated. And we do not really see that secret was copied into X, even though it actually has happened. So given that we have spent so much effort now on defining what information for analysis is doing, um, it would be a pity if you would miss these hidden implicit flows, but fortunately there is a way to uh, make the analysis find these hidden implicit flows. The basic idea is the following. If we have a conditional and there are two branches, B1 and B2, then the analysis will conservatively over approximates all values that may be defined or written in branch B1, and then will add spurious definitions into the other branch B2, and also the same um, the other way around. 
So for our example that we've um, seen earlier, what the analysis would do is to essentially add this um, second branch here that um, is executed if secret is false. And in this case, it would add this spurious definition, which just writes the old value of x again into x, so that when you execute a program, no matter which um, of the two branches you take, there always is a write to x. So basically, there will always be a propagation from what is on the security stack, namely um, the label private, into into x. So by um, by doing this and by adding these spurious definitions, the analysis would be able to reveal these hidden implicit flows because it will always see some data flow under the control of um, the um, yeah of, of the label of secret. So everything we've seen so far was basically true for all kinds of dynamic. Um, information flow analysis. I finally want to have a very brief um, discussion of one implementation of a dynamic information flow analysis, namely an analysis called DITEM. Um, there's a lot more information about this in this paper that I've mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. So if you're interested in how this is actually implemented in practice, just have a look at this paper. But as a very brief summary, what DITEM does is to do dynamic information flow analysis for x86 binaries. So you basically give it an x86 binary and then it's doing something with it. And when you execute this binary, um, you can um, check for violations of an information flow policy. The way DITEM does this is by storing um, the taint markings or the security labels into bit vectors. and there is one such bit vector for every byte of memory in the entire program. So it's relatively expensive to do this, and there are a couple of tricks to make it less expensive. But by having these bit vectors that store the taint markings for every byte of memory, um, the analysis can then propagate um, the taint markings while the program is executing. And to do this, um, it's using um, instrumentation. So it basically adds instructions to the existing program that look at these bit vectors and then propagate the information in these bit vectors whenever some um, relevant operation happens during the program. And one um, final question is, of course, how does the analysis know when it tracks these implicit flows when it needs to pop something from the stack? Because if you just execute a program, you do not know when you've reached the end of a branch. And the answer is that the analysis before doing the instrumentation performs also a static analysis and computes a static control flow graph and then looks at the immediate post dominators of, um, of conditionals in order to find out where the program execution merges again and at this point in time um, pops the uh, security label again from the stack so that um, the security label only remains on the stack as long as it's relevant for tracking implicit flows. All right, so let me summarize this whole lecture on information flow analysis. So this kind of analysis um, is supposed to track the secrecy of information that is handled by the program so that you can check some information flow policy that um, you can define by essentially defining three things, namely the security classes by defining one of these lattices, the sources that create values that need to be tracked and the sinks into which you want these uh, tracked values to not flow. And if they actually do flow into one of these things, then you want to raise um, a violation of the policy. This kind of um, analysis has various applications. It's particularly used for security uh, related applications like malware detection, or for example, checking for vulnerabilities. Now, having said all this, um, always keep in mind that um, even a perfect information flow analysis may not be able to track all kinds of flows of information through a program because actually there are some channels that go beyond the data flows and control flows um, that an information flow analysis is tracking. For example, the program may also leak information through its power consumption so that, for example, one process is reading how much power another process is consuming and that way they can communicate with each other. Or sometimes just the timing of operations can also propagate some information. So just keep this in mind, even if you would have or have an, uh, a perfect information flow analysis, there may still be some um, flow of information that the analysis is missing. All right, and that's already the end of this third part of the lecture and also the end of the information flow lecture. So I hope you've enjoyed it and then see you next time.